allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clark, do I have a roll call, please? <coughs> Alderman Bowen? Present. Alderman Bachman here. Alderman Reese? Present. Alderman Milner? Present. Alderman Dickerson? Here. Alderman Long? Here. Alderman Turner? Present. Mayor Hassan? Here, and we do have a quorum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, tonight we have a proclamation for the Harrisville Cass County businesswomen. If you all would like to join me up here right now. Um, with us tonight, we have Ruth Christian, Betty Beeson, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? All right. Charlie Howe, Kim York, Mary Parker, and Judy Bowman. These are all members of our Harrisville and Cass County Business Women's Association. Um, I will now read their proclamation. <clears throat> all right. Harrisville, Cass County Business Women of Missouri, week 2017. <coughs> Whereas working women constitute 72 million, or almost half of the nation's workforce, and women-owned businesses account for 30% of all businesses, and whereas Harrisville Cass County Business Women of Missouri was organized in 1927 as a social and study club and became chartered in business and professional women in September 1928, and whereas it is their mission to achieve equality for all women in the workplace through advocacy, education, and information, and whereas their local mission focuses on helping women and charities in our community by providing scholarships and educating young women on safety and workplace entry, and whereas Harrisonville Cass County Business Women of Missouri work to elevate the standards for women wherever they may be employed, and whereas Harrisonville Cass County Business Women of Missouri promote the interest of working women to bring about the spirit of cooperation among all working women and extend opportunities through education, information, and fellowship. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Board of Aldermen of the City of Harrisville, I, Mayor Brian Hassick, do hereby <coughs> proclaim October 15th through the 21st, 2017, as Harrisville Cass County Business Women of Missouri Week, and urge all citizens, civic and fraternal groups, educational associations, news media, and other community organizations to join in this salute to working women by encouraging and promoting the celebration of the achievements of all business and professional women as they contribute daily to our economic, civic, and cultural purposes. Did you get the big rooster over in that northeastern town about 11 miles away in a wildcat jersey? Did. You did? Yes, I have a picture I need to share. Oh, Mr. yeah, Benning. you need to get it notarized. Yep, yep. It, uh, I actually have it on my phone. He took. He sat right there at his council meeting wearing that shirt that I wore oh, to the boy. game. So it was a beautiful sight. Well, well, I did that right. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, that. That game, that 98-yard run. That was incredible. Wasn't that something? Yep. 
67 years ago, I was at that same field when that 99 yard run was made. <laughs> I had to wait 67 years to see another one. Well, hey, you were there for both, though. Yeah, That's and a... then last week there's a 97 yard run. Yeah. So, Does that mean this week we'll have a 96 yard? I, I don't know. <laughs> you never go to an athletic event, but you don't expect something exceptional to happen. And, but boy, 67 years is a while. That is a, that is a few years to wait, that's yeah. for sure. Couldn't happen at a better game though, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the highlight of my uh, high school uh, football career was when I scored at that stand against those roosters. Hey, yeah. it doesn't get any better. I never forgot. It can't get any better than that. That's right. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I would like to visit with you a little bit, if I might, uh, uh, about uh, the agenda item that you have, and I've lost my agenda already. I think it's item uh, uh, Council Bill 365 uh, for the second reading. Okay. Um, as you recall, on August the 7th, way I called to this board's attention <coughs> that uh, there were some things out there that really bothered me on that project. And um, one of the things that bothered me was the fact that utilities wasn't extended to the property line. And uh, someone on you, Mr. Mayor, or someone on the board uh, uh, <coughs> promised me that uh, you would get that information. It might have been uh, uh, city administrator of Welch. Anyhow, I was given this picture uh, on the two questions I was asked. And uh, the sewer line uh, is near the property line. Uh, looks like the manhole possibly is about a foot, foot and a half below grade at the present time. But uh, the picture also points out uh, the uh, ground mounted transformers uh, that is serpentined up the property line. And any subdivisions that I've ever worked on, there's always been a utility easement for the electrical, uh, the phones and everything uh, to set on. And uh, I just wondered how that came about. I also wonder how come we let occupancy in without a public sidewalk uh, up to the uh, 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 civic center because I remember when this was first brought before this board many months ago, one of the sale features of it was the fact that the elder believe was going to have a sidewalk to get up to the uh, civic center. And I assume that will happen but uh, it, it, it needs to be in writing that it's going to happen. And then uh, the water line at the <coughs> northeast corner of the, of the property um, is on the south side of the street. And anything that we have ever done has always had to go to the property line. So whoever adds on to that uh, water line will have to bore under that existing street through rock. And uh, I'm not sure that's fair at all concerned. But uh, in order for you to understand that I want to bring a little credibility to this podium about what I'm talking about, I've been in this industry since 1953. I started out as a yard hand at, at the lumber yard. And then I evolved into contracting and then I ended up in my own company in 1962. In that, I had done about 14 subdivisions in this city limits. And uh, I, I've never been able to get by without doing what the ordinance calls. And it seems to me that what is fair, what the ordinance calls for is fair for everybody. When that plat was submitted, I'm sure it was submitted to the Missouri Housing Authority. I'm sure it was submitted the city staff, and then it was submitted to planning and zoning, and then it was submitted to this board. That collector street was on that plat. It's a 36 foot wide street. It is designed through the comprehensive plan to go all the way over to 291, and that plan needs to be stuck with. Once you waiver something like this, the adjoining property owner no doubt is expecting that street to be brought to his property. I think that this board is on a very slippery slope if you waiver that. I have been a witness at trials. I have seen builders have to buy back stuff. 
I have seen developers have to do things that they thought they were not going to have to do. I know of a situation that was settled at Cole County Court last month that's been in court for 17 years, but it was settled. And the people who were the plaintiffs won. So this is long-range planning. I would, if I was in any of your positions, I would want to see a notarized release from the loan company before I, before I would agree to anything. And I would want to see a notarized release from the adjoining property owner if I was going to waiver this street. I think that <coughs> if you waiver this, you've got endless problems down the road. Because the next developer is going to come in and he's going to want to do the same thing. And it is just not fair to all concerned if you waiver that street not being put in. Now, I know that's my opinion, and I think it's the right opinion. And I think there's times in life that you've got to stand up and do the right thing. And I think tonight is the night you need to do that. I know we've got several people here that is interested in this. And uh, anyhow, any questions of me? John, when you were out there, did you happen to notice, are there street lights? I did not see street lights. I did not see street signs. <clears throat> and uh, the last subdivision I put in, I had to buy the street signs. <coughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Is there anyone else this evening? Sun was shining, and we had a we had a good festival. Yeah, and I am here to express appreciation to the city for their involvement. I know they spent many hours, many man hours, and did a, a, a great job. Yeah. Uh, once again, uh, with the new band director that we got last year, we had the band in the parade, which uh, the former band director absolutely refused to be on the parade. So uh, that's a great improvement because bands make parades. And uh, we also had the Shriners, which they always enjoy also. And uh, it's a great way for local organizations and businesses to get their name out. And the organizations, I think, did very, very well this year. We had a little wind, uh, blew a couple of tents down, but uh, nothing to uh, get disparaged. <coughs> so once again, I'd like to thank, uh, thank the city, and uh, we'll do it again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Let's see. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Fairfield, Mr. Welsh, and all the aldermen. Um, I'm just going to be home tonight watching uh, Big Bang, but last week I picked up the uh, Harrisonville Star, and I read that you guys had a pretty uh, uh, rough and ready council meeting last week and uh, you'd ask uh, Mrs. Bowman if she would like to ask you the question where she'd been out of something or whatever and she didn't want to embarrass you. I find that a strange answer since from the time you swore in she's done nothing but try that. You're in this room and anywhere else you can get a crowd. And, uh, it, it kind of upset me because to sit and watch that happen, the first two weeks you were in office, the Chamber of Commerce marched in this room and absolutely took you to task because the city had no jobs, we had no growth, we had empty buildings, 
Hey, excuse me, Obi. Hey, no. Cut, no, out of order. Out of order. Mr. Butler. Mr. Butler. Please, no outburst from the crowd. Anyway, as I said, the chamber marched their whole crew up here, or five of them, and took you to task. And after that, I went down and seen Mr. Carl. And I asked him, I said, are you not embarrassed? Because everything they jumped on you about was the, was the chamber. They're the ones that's supposed to get business in here. They're the ones that's supposed to promote business in here. And you've been a mayor for two weeks. What kind of obligation do you have in a two-week period to change this whole thing around? And it really, really ticked me. And Mrs. Bowman, I'd like you to ask the mayor the question now. Mr. Butler, I might remind you that um, according to our ordinance, I know, and you're not saying that you stuck to John. to the board, I know. not to an individual member. Thank I you. got it. How can you talk to John? John? The gentleman over there with the gray hair. Anyway, um, and the second thing I read was about this village out here. And him being. It, it really got to me because Mr. Wayne, the superintendent out there, would come into the coffee shop every morning complaining about the inspector. The inspector this, the inspector that. And one morning he walked in there and he made the comment that our city inspector had told him that he, he, he could either make him or break him in this city. That's when I called Brad Bachelman. I didn't call Mrs. Milner. I didn't call Judy Reese. I didn't call Judy Bowman. I didn't call David. I didn't call Long. I didn't call Matt. Because not one of those has ever developed a piece of land. I called Brad Bachelman, who happens to do that for a living. And Brad and I went out and met him. He had his uh, electrical superintendent on the job site. He had his excavator on the job site. And they all three would swear to what was going on out there. So I asked Wayne, I said, Wayne, right now on this job site, you've got three footings in, ready to fill them. Without the delays, where should you be? Because he's coming in the winter. <coughs> and he's got frost footings down, and you don't do that when it's froze. He said, right now I should have 13 units in the ground. And he had three. But to make the assumption that Mr. Brockman has got any vested interest in the village is so asinine and so crazy. Language, please. I'm sorry. It could get worse. <laughs> because, like I said, all I got was out of the paper. Uh, Mrs. Hassett wasn't here, so she couldn't video it. And I couldn't watch it. So I'm only going off what Dennis said. But I'm the one that got Brad involved. Nobody else, and I don't have a nickel in the village, okay? I think it's a wonderful thing that we can have 48 housing additions in one lot. Yes, everybody plays by rule, but when I sat on this board, I tried to get the city engineer to make up a pamphlet that whoever walks in that office, whether they're building a commercial building, real estate, or personal property, you hand them the votes, and you're done. They either go with that or they get out. It's easy that way. There's no question. And there's a lot of times that's went on in this town. And like the conversation I had said with, yeah, I can either make you or break you. That comes from a city employee. A city employee that his main job should be to make these people happy. They're in this town to work, to make a living. And you get that comment out of the city employee. We have great city employees. Don't get me wrong. I'm not picking on all city employees. I'm picking on that one. And then to read the paper and see all this, I'm going, wow, what a difference a day makes. Because I was happy. Y'all haven't seen me here for a while. I thought Monday nights were for big banks. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? Be sure to give the clerk your name and address. You'd like to 
Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. I won't do anything. No, you're, you're interrupting. Please, please take your seat. Okay, I've got a couple of questions about the villas, which I take is this 365 that was just referred to. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of delay with that. And my concerns are that clearly, when that is completely set up or housed, that it will put a lot of the Harrisonville homes up for sale, which we need. We're short of, of homes. It will increase revenue from people from the outside coming in. The sales tax was mentioned earlier. And I, I understand that there's a question about this collector road. Mm -hmm. But here's my question. The road, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, is supposed to tie in to the road over by the old Dollar General. Yeah, I believe it's timber, is that timber drive, I always have trouble Yeah, the that. problem with that is, is that road was, did never meet um, city specs. It's a private road currently, I believe. And it's private property. Mm -hmm. So how can we force a developer to tie in to private property? Um, well, at some point, the where the road is stubbed on Jefferson Parkway, I believe our master plan shows eventual connection to timber drive am i correct from that road but yeah currently if you were to say somebody bought all that property from where the, the senior living center is all the way out to just before uh, 291 yes they could not stub into that additional part without somebody either purchasing or upgrading that the the current road is not up to city spec so it was not the city did not accept that into their the, as their city street, which is usually what happens in a development, they uh, what is that term I'm looking for? They they improvements. Well, is it a donation or what is it when we dedication? Dedication. That's the word I'm looking for. They dedicate the road. Um, in that case, they couldn't dedicate the road because it was not uh, up to our current city spec. So it's just a private road that stops there where the old Dollar General used to be. Well, how is it fair <clears throat> to expect that the developer? to go past what they are really have access to because it's a private road. And I think what, what we're just doing is discouraging other developers from coming into town, which we've already had a problem with anyway. Which brings me to the 353. Apparently that uh, terminology was changed just for that project to include that all investors had to be uh, listed is that the, the chapter the chapter 430 that's on our agenda tonight that deals with the 353 tax abatements uh -huh. um, we had an application from a group looking to redo the old hospital I think it was called Harrisonville senior living um, they uh, uh, have since withdrawn their application we had voted not to move forward with doing the abatement um, during that process our uh, attorney that we hired lobber law firm is our advisory attorney and Mr. Fairfield, our, our city attorney, both noticed uh, there were some, some breakdowns in our, our current code. It really didn't even match up with what's in the state statutes. Um, so it was highly recommended that once that, that application was no longer uh, active, that we would review that and uh, update our own ordinance, which you don't do that while you have a current application. You do it when you don't have one, because otherwise it would look that you're trying to make a change midstream. So that's why that has come about is because uh, uh, we found that there were things that needed to be updated after we went through that process. But wasn't there a request uh, by Alderman Bowman to for this project that all investors be listed? There was a request for um, information on, I believe it was four or six different LLCs um, essentially, it was it was documentation that is is public record. Um, that it came about from our discussion on the 353. Um, we have specific requirements in there on on uh, showing ownership, uh, certain documents that must be provided. Um, it was the discussion was should we request that of all developers, not just ones looking for a tax incentive. Um, that's what sparked that conversation, and, and there was a, was a request made for further information about the, the group that's here tonight for the senior villas looking for the um, road change. 
my question would then be, why would some of the board members be very uh, for the 353 for the hospital, but then against it for the villas? What's well, anything the, to do with it? the villas isn't, isn't, isn't asking for any type of abatement. They, they are a, uh, a tax credit funded program. Um, they asked for no incentives of any kind from the city, whereas the other group was a, a different project altogether, and it was one that was looking uh, to make use of incentives. Okay. Now, with um, what was just previously mentioned about uh, asking any one person anything specific, I would like to suggest to the board that if anyone isn't willing to back up an accusation and have proof at the time, that it not be made. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak this evening? All right. Seeing so you no know one, I will close public participation and we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, first tonight, you have the minutes from the regular meeting of October 2nd, uh, 2017. I do believe this one has some amendments uh, or updates. I'm not sure the, the yeah. addition we have. It's got corrections. corrections. Okay. Yeah. All right. I want to be sure there's a lot of paperwork in front of me when I sat down. So um, there were three corrections um, that are highlighted in yellow. Uh, I assume it's that's what's added is the. It's either grammatical or commas or ands. <coughs> okay. Okay. Nothing substantial. Nothing significant. Just some All right. House Move to approve. Second. I have a motion from Alderman Dickerson and a second from Alderman Wall. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, next, you have the uh, minutes from the budget meeting of October 9th, 2017. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion from Alderman Dickerson and a second from Alderman Milner. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. All right. Um, now we have the minutes from executive session on October 2nd, 2017. Move to approve. Second. Motion from Alderman Dickerson and a second from Alderman Turner. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, minutes are approved. Uh, on to our agenda. First item tonight is a pr uh, appointment for the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, we'll have a Robert Wiseman who has applied. Um, let's just get involved. Um, he would be filling the seat vacated by Nancy Lennon. Um, looks like he has everything here. He was a, an older home, I believe, on Wall Street, that's all. So. <coughs> Make a motion to approve. Motion from second. I have a motion from Alderman Dickerson and a second from Alderman Long for approval. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We have a new member of our Historic Preservation Commission. Um, IMB special use permit or event permit, excuse me, for the Twin Oaks Block Party 2017. Good evening, Mayor. Members of the board, before you tonight is an application from Carrie Foreman. We live on Twin Oaks Drive. She would like to have a, a block party on Twin Oaks, blocking from 2503 to 2403. Uh, I believe the majority of the neighbors are going to participate. Um, the only thing I'm not oh, October 28th, she's wanting to do this. Um, we have had block parties in that specific area in the past, no problems, no concerns. We haven't seen any uh, problems or concerns with this one. I would recommend it. All right. Any questions for the chief tonight? Right. I make a motion to approve. Second. You have a question? Uh, well, let me get the. I have a, yeah. a motion from Alderman Dickerson, and I have a second from Alderman Milner. Mr. Turner, did you have a. That is my street. Can you be sure you use your. Yeah. This is my street, and it's starting at my house. Uh, I, I'm in favor of it, so I'll buy me. I have anything to come from it. Anyone ever know that? It is a, 
It is my street. All right. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Party on. Uh, next, we have a special event permit for Veterans Day recognition. Uh, yes, this is an annual event. Uh, I actually uh, attended this last year, and it was a very nice event. This one, uh, they are requesting for Veterans Day, Saturday, November 11th, blocking off the west side of the square, and just a little bit of the south side uh, around the Dolboy statue. Um, and then they're anticipating a crowd size of about 300. Uh, they have done this for years. Uh, we had no problems, no, no complaints, no concerns. Uh, we're recommending approval for this year as well. Entertain any questions? Mm -hmm. Any questions for the chief on this one? Okay. Okay. Motion from Alderman Milner and a second from Alderman Dickerson. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> All right, it is approved. All right, uh, next we have Council Bill 65. Um, before we have the second reading, um, we do have the developer here tonight to um, speak to us. And so I will have her come up here before we have second reading. <laughs> You're all right. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the board. Uh, half of you look familiar to me, and half uh, are, are new, some new faces. So. Uh, for those of you that are new faces, let me just give you a little bit of background. A couple of years ago, and it's, it's, it's hard to believe it was two years ago, uh, I came here because I was asking for your support for a project to the Missouri Housing Development Commission. I'm delighted to say that you gave me your support two years ago, and I'm delighted to say that we received funding, and I'm also delighted to say that we are almost complete with construction of a seven and a half million dollar project in your community. Um, the project, as I think many of you know, and um, I didn't realize that it was going to be uh, already talked about, so, uh, but um, it, the project is 48 units of senior housing. Each of those units is two bedroom, one bath, and those units rent for $490 a month. Um, those um, affordable units are extremely important, and those of you that heard me a couple of years ago, um, those are really important for seniors that are living on fixed incomes at the lowest level of Social Security uh, because that we try to do something that is truly affordable for folks so they have enough money to pay for not only their housing expense but utilities, medicine, and um, living expenses. So uh, I, I'm also delighted to tell you that we've had a huge reception um, and interest in the project. We've done a rolling occupancy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and then I'm going to talk about the topic at hand. But we did a rolling occupancy, and what that means is as units were completed, we have uh, received certificates of occupancy, and we've uh, occupied those units. We have uh, over 200 people on the waiting list for units in Harrisonville Villas, which I'm delighted to tell you. Uh, I'm only sad to tell you that we can't obviously house all of those folks. But um, at the people that are already in the units, I think, are very pleased. I think they like the development. It's been well received. So when we came, um, I, I, I think I told you. Um, I, unfortunately, I've slept since then, and, and you all have too. But um, when I came, I told you that MHDC uh, really likes to see more multifamily type development. And, um, I have a personal bias against apartment style living because I'm from outstate Missouri and that's not how we live in, in outstate Missouri. So it was really important to us to do two things. Number one, um, those that have the money and make these allocations, they, they make the rules. And so we did a development that is a multifamily development, but it's very low density. Um, so it, people have a front door and a back door, they have garages, and it's, it lives like a single family home, like most folks are, are used to living in. So that was really important to us. But I wanted to tell you that because um, the gentleman that spoke earlier during the public comment um, uh, section kept talking like we were doing a subdivision, and, and we did not do a subdivision. We did a, a single owner 
uh, <coughs> development that we own all 48 of the units and the community building. We did not plat that separately. It's platted as one lot. So, and I do have with me tonight Greg Lee, and I'll invite him up in a minute to talk about um, some of the, the, the two things that were mentioned, that those are private loops, and, and there's, we have not, I, the point of all that is, we have not tried to do anything that is not consistent with what the city requirements are. So, I, I wanted to tell you that. So, I'm going to, if Mayor, if it's okay, and I pass these out. So, what I'm here to talk about, is this section of road that is on this sheet that is highlighted, it's Timber Drive. And I'm going to do this because I'm slow at passing and, and I can <laughs> talk and make it so that we don't stay here um, it, unnecessarily long. So I'm asking you all to consider allowing us uh, to not extend Timber Drive uh, for that area that is shown by the green highlighting that's on your page. So uh, let me back up just a little bit and tell you that when we came to the city and we talked about our project, as you all know, that property was undeveloped and we wanted to do exactly what we've done. And there was a question when we said we wanted to do this development, whether or not there was a need for a collector road to access our property. And we didn't pursue that at the time because the way our process works is once we get funding, we have to go pretty quickly because we uh, have a tax credit syndicator that's buying credits, and they're buying those based on when we can put units in service. And so we have kind of a ticking clock that makes us have to produce our units at when we tell our investor that they're going to be produced. If we don't, there's a financial penalty to us. And so at the time, we didn't go forward and we didn't make any kind of argument with respect to going uh, to constructing the collector road of Timber Drive. We went forward and when we did this two years ago, uh, we knew that it was a seven and a half million dollar project and we make certain assumptions based on how much things are going to cost and what we're required to do in terms of infrastructure for our project. Some of those things that we were required to do uh, when we actually started construction were not things that we were told we were going to have to do when we started construction and when we were in the planning phase to put that budget together. So we had some issues, and Greg is going to come up in a minute, and he's going to talk about all of those specifically. But we had issues with respect to, to water, uh, sewer, electric, basically all the infrastructure things that, that we were required to do that involved had city involvement. The reason I mention those things is because those things, um, the, the information we were given early on and what they turned out to be were different numbers. And so that caused us to have increased cost with respect to our construction budget. And good or bad, the way MHDC works is we have a finite amount of money. We, there's no going back to the till. You get what you get. You say you're going to build a project for seven and a half million dollars and that's how much money you have. And so those additional costs, both from, uh, and Greg will uh, go through them, those cost money to the project. Now, one of the things that we really pride ourselves in is delivering a project that we are good stewards of public money, so that we deliver truly affordable housing. When we have increased cost, somebody has to pay for that cost, and, and the way that that happens is that means an increase in rent, which is not at all what we want to do. We are very proud that we have uh, such affordable rent for our senior development, and we want to keep those rents as low as possible. So when we are coming tonight to ask about Timber Drive, the reason we're asking for, it, for that concession is so we don't have to look to any kind of rent increases down the road, and to hopefully help us offset some costs that we didn't anticipate, nor were we informed about when we started the project. Now, I want to mention one other thing, and then I will ask Greg to come up and just talk about some specific things, and of course, I'll have to answer any questions, too. But the other thing I wanted to, to mention, uh, because some uh, the gentleman that spoke earlier talked about how the, if you make this decision, that that's going to be a slippery slope. Typically, how developments work is property owners share in the cost of development. And so, as you can see on the road, We've, we've built that road out about 55% of the way of, of the stub in. Uh, the other property there is owned by one owner. It's owned by the Wellborn family. Um, and so that 
their property has already received a benefit on the other side of the road. So that property is already served and has an access point, and they've paid no money for that. To go forward uh, with any development on that site, a future developer would have to go ahead and put some, some additional road cost in their budget. That's not something the city would have to do. That's something that a developer would have to do. Um, so I, I, that's what our request is tonight, is that we are asking that you all <coughs> will give us a concession to allow us not to further that road construction, but to leave it as it is, which is sufficient to serve our project. Uh, and it is built to city standards. And then I do want to mention one other thing that I think that was important. Um, you know, this development, um, uh, to, from a city perspective, the other thing that this development does is it, it obviously creates 48 new households and a 48 unit development that now is on the tax rolls where there was nothing before. So the city has received a benefit. Is not We're not asking the city to do something that's going to unfairly uh, inhibit development going forward. In fact, we've already given future development a head start by extending the road as we have. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg to come up to talk to, to specifically, uh, because um, I'll introduce Greg. Greg is one of the principals with Double Diamond Construction. He, uh, they were our contractor for this job. And uh, Greg is going to talk about the, the delays and the different information that we receive. So to better educate you all about that, unless you have any questions of me before. Um, I think we can hold, we'll hold questions till sure. we're, you're all done, and then if anybody has any time, yeah. I'll, I'll stay right here. All right. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Good evening. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> yes. Uh, two or three things. That, that my role is to take and discuss some of the exact cost of some of what I'll consider the additional burdens that we're trying to take and do a little bit of justice here in, in theory. But, but first of all, to a quick background to, to remind those and, and so that when I address a couple of Mr. Foster's things, while I may not have been around 67 years to watch a couple of different football plays, I, I've done a little bit of development so I understand some of the questions he was asking and they were very valid. He had some good points and it's like anything else when you only have so much information, sometimes a, a simple answer to a complicated question would be inaccurate. I have personally developed to me, I've been at risk and had to take and explain to my wife why she was also signing a personal guarantee of about 1,900 of these units in my life. Between myself and the two other founders of, of Double Diamond, we're probably in the 4,500 units worth of developments of this type in various aspects, ranging anywhere from 32 units to 266 unit developments. So there's been a little bit of exposure there. I've also been involved in subdivisions, I've been involved in commercial, both retail and office. So I've had some exposure to, I've estimated that just myself combined with a little bit of Pat and Chad, we've probably seen at least 100 different municipalities or jurisdictions of some type. And everybody has their own quirk and what is important to them. So we understood going into it that we were going to have some things that we were going to do. But this is a private development. The street out there is, Deb said, is private. The water line has two meters because I just paid for those meters the other day. Mr. Welch? Yes, sir. Okay. For the meter setting to be truthful, for your water department to be setting them, we have two water meters running a private loop line within that thing because the water is being carried by the development, so it's, it's a one-bill type system with, with the municipality, with the, with the utility. So that covers that. Uh, as to the easement, everything's been done within easements. If it appears that something is without an easement, we will adjust the easement, have that engineered, uh, had to do that back and forth. Had one in Columbia where actually the, the utility was outside their easement. And while we were doing some lowering of, of the line, they actually asked if they could take and carve the line in there and drop it back within the easement so that they didn't have to go through the legal rigmarole of, of doing another easement. The utilities to the property line, the utilities in question, it goes back to, to the sewer. The sewer serves it. We had to bring the sewer line, I believe, about 1,300 feet to get to that site. The water is set up where it can take its stuff off and then go each direction to take and, and help with, you know, at least what's been tapped. You're coming right off of Jefferson Avenue to take and deal with the rest of the Wellborn's land. Uh, as to the signage, yes, you'd like to, signage to be up theoretically from day one. Some of the areas in question where you really need the signage is right at Timber and, and, and the little cross street leading into the private street. That's also the area that has the, the last little bit of grading that needs to be done 
So we'll first do what we'll call grading and then final grading, which basically makes it sod ready. And if you haven't driven through that, these folks had take in decided for a number of reasons, including there is you know, a little bit of variation, a little bit of elevations out there, to cut down on the erosion probability and to give it that nice pretty curb appeal from day one. Uh, Deb and Becky had decided that they were going to side a good chunk of it, at least get the fronts and X percentage around the outside. And we've been working with the, the city officials regarding the TCOs, because they're technically not certificate of occupancy at this point. They're temporary certificates of occupancy, whereby the final certificate of occupancy, which, which is the big ticket that the investor in the state of Missouri is looking for, will not be given over until all of those public improvements inclusive of the sidewalk, inclusive of the signage, et cetera, is done. And I, this is really a little bit out of sequence, but when you talk about some of those things that you all wish were, were complete, minute one or every time you drive out there, we just on October 9th were given the requirement to add upwards of 10 fire lane signs where the fire department had requested that one side be blocked off so that no one would ever park there and that no one could ever park in on the cul-de-sacs. We were just told that on October 9th. We just received, after getting some engineer drawings about how we would place the signage and what side of the street that, that had been elected, we just received that approval at 142 today. So those fire signs have not been put up, but we, again, we were just approved on that. And there's some retaining wall that's part of that grading issue we're speaking of, that the engineering just came through because it had to be re-engineered once. We, we didn't like the way it was out there. We asked Deb and Becky if they could please to send their engineer out because we had some concerns and questions. Everybody went through that and drew the city into that. That approval was also given at 142 today. So sometimes it looks like something's incomplete. It's kind of like when you go into a kitchen after a Sunday brunch. It doesn't look good. But you can either check it out that morning or check it out later that afternoon. And it's a nice, clean, spick and span kitchen. But right at the end of lunch, it doesn't look good. Some of the things we ran into economically through there was, I've never had this happen before, the fire department was insistent that we have the hydrants were closer to where we were framing. When we asked why, their comment was is that from a safety point of view, that if the building started on fire, they wanted the ability to put them out. I don't want this to sound flippant because it's not exactly how the conversation went, but we made the comment that, that well, we're not that broke up if you do have that type of fire because it really won't be at that stage where the loss level versus the life safety health risk level to, to the firemen. They insisted, so there's you know a couple three thousand dollars for us to take in temporarily tap, dig a line, put it just barely under underground. It changed the way our grading program is going to go because of where those lines were for us to take a pole uh, fire hydrant so we could just start framing. So you have a delay before we could start framing when we had the platforms of which we were speaking of earlier, which means the slats. That's when you pour the foundation and you pour the nice pretty slab. We couldn't build right away. So between the time that it took that we discussed the last time I was here of some difficulty in getting the inspector to get comfortable with some of the geotech combined within the framing, we probably lost four to five weeks. Well, four to five weeks the construction time and overall some of these other delays easily cost us from a construction time about two months. Well, two months to our firm is probably ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars a month and all the support, paying for supervision, paying for trailers, paying for temporary water electric. I can't even imagine what it is uh, for the developer because it would be a piece of the construction interest for those one or two months of which we're speaking. So you have a cost there that she, she hasn't even economically tried to, to define because it's one of those that how do you choose the month and where's the interest, kind of like is the interest stronger on the seventh year of your house payment than on the 17th year of your house payment. But somewhere in there you had a cost. We had uh, the uh, sewer piping material. While there's still some funds owed by the city of about $3,900 where your staff had requested that we upsize and change what they call schedule, which is what us laymen would call the size of the pipe. They'd ask in mid-strike. However, that pipe was already delivered. There had already been mobilization. There had already been delivery fees the whole bit. That had to be reloaded back up on a truck and hauled back off, and then the, the next size brought back in. The municipality had asked us to do that in mid-stride. Those are those changes we're speaking of, that at the end of it, we all end up with a set of as built so we know exactly what we put in the ground and what we put in the air. But at that time, we went into it thinking it was going to be Schedule X and ended up being Schedule Y. There's a $3,900 charge that thus far we've been carrying. We haven't submitted a bill for that, but that's what the agreement was on the municipality's part. To me, that's part of the public-private partnership. 
it doesn't really affect us if you're willing to take and pay for it. But it did have some unofficial effect and a little bit of delay. It was doing some, some work in those areas, plus the cost to the, to the, uh, the firm, the excavating firm, for them to take and reload and haul that equipment back and beg to not have a restocking charge with the firm which, with whom they draw the material from. So you have things like that. The electric, that was a really big issue in the last vote. And the reason that this road has become a, a, an even bigger issue is we went into this and the plans and the expectations <coughs> were is surrounding this called rectangular piece of property would be electric that could service less than 1,000 square foot units, two bedroom, one bath, and you know the HVAC system and the, the lighting system, outlets, et cetera, to drive safe. <coughs> two people is, is the most accuracy you usually see in that. Two people do not generate or draw that much electricity. However, we were requested by uh, your, your deceased, uh, I guess it would be electric department head, I'm not sure with the proper terminology, but Keith had requested that we put three phase all the way around the property. Well, three phase is what you drive a three story office building, <coughs> and you've heard of <coughs> phase, and you've heard of dropping a leg. Well, that's where you have three phase. To put three phase in is subdivision. I, I made this a little bit flippantly the last time we had this discussion, but we're not putting in three phase microwaves. We're not putting in three phase toasters. The, the, there's not much draw really with the efficiency nowadays of, of the of the refrigerators. And to be truthful, uh, under this program under MHDC, we're required to build under NAHB Green, so everything is to that inside their Energy Star. And we actually had a tester who comes out and tests the unit where they do blower motors and make sure the efficiency. And he had some changes he asked us to do and the way some of the insulation right where the garage and the building comes together. They're very serious about this. It's a third party that has to take and stipulate to all parties, including lenders and the state agency, that we're doing it to match that, that efficiency level. So to take and have to put three phase around there, at one point it was going to be up, up around $37,000, $38,000, $40,000. They finally acquiesced and the back line of the property, so if you, it would be the, the property line that runs parallel to Jefferson Parkway. That wasn't put in quite three phase. The other three legs were. To this day, nobody can really give me a good explanation. I am not an engineer. I don't claim to be an engineer. I'm not an architect. I don't have any of those type designations. But I've been in the industry and have built enough property that to this day I can never get a good answer. So there's thirty something thousand dollars just to take it. It come out to be about thirty after you drop that back away. That's a lot of money. So you kind of you combine kind of unnecessary things and unknown things. The unknown being the three phase. Unknown being like the fire lanes. Okay. Those aren't going to cost very much, but you take about ten of those and it starts becoming quote real money. The sidewalk that we spoke of earlier, again, we will not be able to take and draw. And Chris Arthur's made it really clear to me like that. We've, we've had great conversation. Chris has been really good to deal with. He's been a good addition to you folks. But we will not be able to draw a certificate of occupancy, which is where the investor will, will then become happy, the state of Missouri will become happy, until such time as we've completed all the improvements. And that would be the sidewalk along Jefferson Parkway. And that would also be the sidewalk that accesses from the end of our cul-de-sac, kind of near the little gazebo pavilion, however you like to describe it, up towards the, the community center there. Well, why hasn't the sidewalk been put in? Frankly, I like they put it in X number of months ago. But at one point, that was on the table for possibly because it's kind of a sidewalk that doesn't lead anywhere. There isn't a sidewalk in front of the community center, and there isn't a sidewalk on the well-worn land. But the desire is such that let's go ahead. If we keep saying we'll do it the next time. So the desire in, and we had a lot of pushback, and, and I understand so. As developers, you're going to ask for a few things and know that you're not going to receive everything. So Happy's kind of made it clear as have others that we will be putting in the sidewalk. At one point, the delay on that was, is we were quoted at a meeting that I believe the mayor had attended and, and Mr. Bachman that, that you folks could do it for X number of dollars, which was that much cheaper. So we had volunteered, and there's some email chains going back and forth. Or I say we, the developers, had volunteered to escrow the funds equivalent to that dollar. If the city thought that they could do it cheaper, they were going to take and buck up what that estimate was, like that. It turned out that the city does not believe that they can do it any less expensive than we can. So, okay, the burden now falls back on us, and we will be putting in that sidewalk that Mr. Foster brought up, and, and he's correct that that completion of public improvements as the site plan is designated needs to be brought to form. But if you go back to that site plan, there's been a few things kind of added to it. There's been some time delays that can be quantified, but they don't really show up on a site plan. <laughs> uh, you know, the electric kind of being a biggie, a few of the others. So, 
the, the, the request is, is recognition of some of those things that went into it. And there has been a little bit of turnover for various reasons at a couple, three different levels. So you have that institutional knowledge that walks out the door. It sometimes makes it hard to move as quickly as you'd like, or to take and have everybody's memory be on the same page. So what, what Deb and Becky are asking for is just what is normal in every development I've done, you've not been required to take and do 100% of the street down your side when there's an adjoining piece of property. As I was showing a couple people out in the hallway, if they would have selected to take and put their egress, egress further up towards the back of the property, it would have required them, if we had been doing this development in any other municipality, to have built, say, 75% of that road. On the flip side, if they would have built it closer to Jefferson Parkway, there still would have been the requirement under every time I've done a development to build it out to 50% so it would have gone past just what you need to take an access. So at, at roughly 55% of the linear footage that we're speaking of on that whole side, and I believe the entire linear footage is just left in 500, I'm doing it from memory, 44 sound right? Like that. We, we broke the 242 foot mark in what has been in, included on there. And then the, the, the final thing, I do believe that, that there was some question regarding uh, where the curbs were and the whole bit. We went to the city because we know when you have this much activity and when you have rolling construction and rolling move-ins and you have moving trucks and you have units that are over here done but we're still delivering you know, drywall or roof trusses or whatever there with heavy trucks. Concrete trucks are still coming in there. We want, we asked Mr. Walsh and his staff, and we, we, we formally requested if we could take, and both on our street and on, quote, your street that hasn't been dedicated to the will, if we could take a port where it was a little bit short so we could put a nice pretty topping on it so you'd end up with a nice, clean, undamaged street as opposed to pouring it up to the top and then pouring all of our equipment and all that mud and everything else over it, and you end up with a street that already has a little bit of wear and tear on it. So that street still, and I believe it's next Saturday, it's tentatively scheduled, but we all call it a two-inch topping on what's been poured so far, on, this, on the, the part that will be dedicated, and then they'll pour all in one run, that little cold sack that has been done. And if you haven't been out there and driven around, other than you never get rid of mud fast enough and the dirt and the rocks, it's a really handsome subdivision. It really is. It's pretty. We're very proud of being participant in, in this you know, construction job in this development. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or, or perhaps you have some for Dale. I have one question. On your comment about the electrical engineer and wanting to have three-phase electricity out there, it was in his contention that he talked to me about that, and he knew it was uh, more to ask of you than normal, but his concern was the people that were going to be in that housing project were going to be elderly, some of them on oxygen, some of them on special electrical <coughs> needs. And he was going to wire that up so if electricity went out on this side of his grid, he would have other legs of electricity to bring in to keep their oxygen going. That's why he asked you to do that. So that if electrical grids went down in the town somewhere, he could supply your uh, project with maybe handicapped people with electricity. That was, his, that was the reason why he wanted that. If you, and I'm saying that his <coughs> and, and I understand, and, and so we're, we're both arguing far and against someone that isn't here to take I their that. position. I just want to make sure you understood that it, his request. It wasn't that was his rationale to do. My argument to that is, is if you think about it, about a straight, a, a straight grid pattern where it's, it streets this way and avenues that way. The the reason that you do box each property is so that if there is a problem, you can then route and they can shunt off. You know, they just reach in with that little little uh, fiberglass pole and they shunt off so it, it kind of forces the water back around. It's the same thing as if you have a continuous loop on water. You might have a problem over there, but then they could shut just that bad section down and reroute the water elsewhere. So I understand what he's saying, but you don't need three phase to do that. No, you, you, right you can set up your grid even on single phase. He could have said, could you do us a favor, can we run a parallel? I've, I've done it twice, I don't like it, but it's kind of the, the alternate. But he was so insistent on three-phase, and the truth is, is that commercial property is the only thing that usually uses three-phase. That or industrial. I can tell you this, I don't know exactly why he wanted it. That was his uh, reasoning for it, and I know you've had problems with some of the employees in the past that are probably not here anymore. But he certainly wasn't one of them. The employees that are here right now have been great to deal with. 
Okay, so let's, if the windshield's this big, the rear view mirror's this big. Employees right now have been great to deal with. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a couple questions? Sure. Okay. I did go out there this afternoon to drive around because I've had several people make some concerns and I wanted to see for myself. <clears throat> like you said, it's a beautiful area and I think it is truly an asset to our community. Having said that, when you all came in and, and, and got all the specs from the city and got your, um, your site plan and everything set up, <clears throat> and you gave us the designs of what your community, your whole community was going to look like, was the road on there as is plotted out and the sidewalk? The road and the sidewalk were on there. Okay, how about the street signs? I, I don't know what the argument is about the street signs. Well, I mean, but in, in any little community... The fire lane signs were not fire on there. Street signs, signs fire lane signs yes. were not on there. Okay. The sidewalk, the question was, is could you folks do it cheaper, which is the reason there's been a delay. But that was late in the project. That was originally on mm -hmm. your original plan, yes. correct? What about street lights? No. How come there are no street lights out there? Is it because of the size of the area? What this, the, the size, they're kind of low slung. What you end up doing is you put wall packs up. And when you do, they call it photometric. And when you look at the drawing, it shows how many lumens. And lumens is when you go to buy like your, your CFLs and now your LEDs. It, how much light does it throw off? Like that. So each unit will have their own there's, light. That there's wall packs that shine out. Yeah, for, there, there, the are, there are two sets of lights. Okay. So there are lights that the individual tenant can turn on and off. Then there are wall packs on the side of the building that are uh, not controlled by the tenant. Okay. They just come on. Come on if you were to go out there and look at a four, if you were to look at a fourplex and look at the side of the building, you will see that there's an additional meter. Um, not every one, but there's an additional meter to what we call a house meter. And that's the one where the house pays for it. It's not Mr. Right. and Mrs. Smith living in unit 1A. Okay. Um, next question. Infrastructure. I mean, I think coming into a community, we have pretty basic standards that we have with all development. I'm sure John's dealt with it over the time and everybody else who has had it. So what that would have been in our information going out to you about infrastructure could not have possibly been in there that would have caused you problems? Well, the, the electrical was a big thing for me. Electrical, yeah, and, and David dealt with that and, and you know, we were blessed to have Keith for the time that we could because he was a progressive thinker and he thought long range as opposed to right now. So that, but the rest of the infrastructure, I, I don't understand where you got into delays with that. What, what you have is, is, is that's where we always run into and, and I had a municipality that basically picked up the phone and called me and chewed the architects, but at the state of Missouri, they have deadlines that you have to hit when you turn in certain documentation that kind of like put you lockstep. And in the, in the state, it was March 31st or 30th or whatever it was a year plus ago. At the time, we were in what we call preliminary discussions of, look, what you're now asking us to do from both the infrastructure meeting, the, the collector road street, and from the three phase that was thrown on us is aggressive. We tried that over the course of the summer to have that conversation with the staff didn't get very far, and I tried to look while I was sitting back there, but I believe a sh right at a uh, short two years ago, or right at, it was in November or December, we sat down with some department heads and the mayor brought us up and we tried to walk through some of those things. We were given indication that there was some fluidity on each of those subjects, so we didn't press it real hard, and then we kind of backed away, and then this one moved forward, this one came back, in the case of the electric, he finally told the electrician, don't worry about that back thing. And it wasn't done in as formal of a manner as we're doing now. But there was a discussion with the department heads, et cetera, both offline and at a meeting that the mayor attended. Was that in November two years ago? Mm, I don't remember what month it was. I do remember two, that you mentioned the, the scheduled pipe. I was out there the day um, Alderman Balk and I were both out there with, with uh, Eric Patterson the day that the scheduled pipe that they were to use, I want to say it was supposed to be a Schedule 4, but the plans they received from City Hall so showed Schedule 3. So they were following the plans they had approved from City Hall, from our Community Development Department. This is what you're supposed to put in. When they came to inspect, this inspector came out, they said, no, this is supposed to be Schedule 4, this is Schedule 3, that's not right. So that's what we went out and visited. Eric looked at it. Eric talked to one of the plumbers, I believe, out there. Right. And Eric's the one that, I mean, he pretty much 
I didn't say anything. I just kind of stood there and watched Eric take care of it. He he addressed it and, and agreed, yeah, the plans were not correct. Um, and that's where the exchange of pipe and, yeah, so and that's the so that There's, there's <coughs> one foot and you like you, everyone likes these things to be perfect and planned down the way. <coughs> but for various reasons, it won't be robust on both sides for little, little variances. This is a little bit bigger than a, than a little bit on the flip side, a couple things that the municipality requested of us to do or a little bit more than just these little minor $3,000 worth of schedule on piping. So that's where you come back and you go, look, you try to eat what you can, eat what you can, eat what you can, and you just you run out of, of funds and, and it, it was no one thing. Like everything else, it's no one thing that really kind of brings us to the point. Uh, if we would have had half a dozen of those others, sometimes you just suck it up because you want to be a good corporate citizen, you want to remember it's not something that came pat in hand and gravel, as opposed to somebody put up a nice hands and develop it. And that's kind of our goal going into it. We're at the tail end of here of this thing, and it's kind of like, you know, ladies, here's some things we run into. And I mean, this is this is kind of starting to creep up there. Well, and, 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 and I appreciate that. And that's why I was asking a question about because, you know, I just do, knew we, that do we need to update what we're giving out to people, I guess, because it kind of makes us look like idiots at the end. Well, I, I think that's one of those, it, you know, it's it's a, I think, it, I mean, I think Master, Mr. Minnie kind of talked about this when he was on the board. Developments always have little fluky things that come up. They're not all the same. You're always dealing with something, and I think a lot of these things are really different. I think we've had those over the years. I mean, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look good, but it, how you address it is Absolutely. what makes you look good or bad. If you address it and you take but care of it, I'm going to use the fire lane as an example because when you're talking about by ten or twelve signs that say fire lane in the whole bit, Kip was really big, and to a lesser extent, Mr. Deluca about telling us to make sure that we had a certain circumference of the cul-de-sac. And we all got a little bit of amusement because his phrase was, this is so the apparatic turning radius, mm -hmm. apparatic meaning your, your fire, fire, turn. Mm -hmm. fire engine, okay? And we got a kit that I hadn't heard put that way, like an yeah, apparatic turning radius like that. He was real strong on that. So we made sure of that. Well, you would have thought that at that time, you just said, hey, we need the cul-de-sac to be so big, and by the way, we're gonna give up one side of no parking because we want to make sure that there's lane for these vehicles to get through. Okay, then you go into it and when you're doing your little fine tuning and you got a little slush fund because this bid comes in twenty eight hundred dollars lower than you thought it would. Hey, we got by the way ladies that twenty eight hundred bucks you thought you had to just burn it up in the sun. That type of thing. Have this thing happen on October 9th. Okay. We have twelve of those come in on October 9th or in that left little window and it kind of sucks up what little bit's kind of left at the end. It's kind of the last day of, of your vacation when Things are a little thin on how much money you remember to bring in your pocket. Um, okay, so the other thing I was going to ask, um, the um, which I understand that, and you know, I know you came to us and you were not a happy camper about the inspections going on. So <clears throat> the city itself coughed up what, ten thousand? Twelve thousand. Twelve thousand to get an inspector out there to get you moving and get you on task. We so, coughed up fifty-two fifty. I understand that, but that was not our responsibility actually going in. We had an inspector, and that's, but we graciously did that. So, you know, I understand that, and that's money we didn't have to put out, but we were trying to help out and, and be doing it. But, you know, I, I, I guess my biggest problem, and we addressed this at the last meeting, was if that street is not finished as it was platted and as we expected it to be, what does that do to the Welburn's property as far as anybody else ever coming in? And somebody made a comment <clears throat> the other night about, well, let whoever develops the next session come in and finish it. That's what well, we who in their right done. mind is going to do that? that? That's the way development is done. I've said I've been in 100 municipalities. Brad, would I've, you do that? Yes. You, you expect to have some public infrastructure. <clears throat> and in this case, it is actually a little more expensive to take a tie and tap in right up there along Jefferson Parkway. So even if we were at the 50-50 mark, the, the burden on the other side, if you were doing it in today's dollars, not two and a half years from now, but the burden on the other side is slightly, just a hair less. And and happy, you've had some development experience, so do you, I don't want you to agree with the side I'm taking, but you understand the concept of what I'm saying, that, that it's more expensive to take and do it upwards along the street where you are, tying in and tapping into sewer, you're tapping into water, etc., and you're running that down there. Same thing with the sanitary, you know. So you got all, all those three. You're running it down there. The next person is 
they're just coming where they they're not going to caps off and tap it in at the same level, and they just continue. And in this case, they're pouring 45 percent of the street that's built to a pretty good grade. That collector road is of the same size, if not slightly larger than, than you know, it's, than Jefferson Parkway. That's a nice road. That burden is not normal in anything I've ever done in 100 municipalities. To finish that road. To, to all, you usually only put in half, unless, as I said, your ingress egress point is past the 50 percent point. Tough. If that's the best thing, the way your civil lays out for you to put in your road, you have to build a little bit farther. But historically, going into that, that's one of the first things we said, I, I, the Mayor, when we had that meeting, I made it real clear to you, I've never poured a whole road on a side of, of a piece of dirt when there's an adjacent piece of property. When the discussion, and I remember the discussion was we, we had it as an item to discuss further, and I remember it came up that the timetable that, you know, hey, we got to get moving, you know, we'll, at that point it was, it was, we've got to go, we'll, we'll do the road, we're not worried about, you know, we're more worried about our timetable, and like I said, that's without any other foreseens at that time, and then we've had some things along the lines. Now, I, I'm, my, one of my questions is, has anyone, you know, everybody talks about the adjoining property owner, there's only one property owner, the Welburns. Have you spoke? With Mr. Wellborn, and how does he feel? I, I did speak to Mr. Wellborn. Uh, he is, uh, you know, he is supportive. Of what his quote to me was is, he is supportive. He would like it to. He said, "I don't want to hurt you on the road." He did say, um, and I said, "Well, I don't. I can't speak for the city." And I think he mentioned this to you, Mayor. He did say that he would like the city to consider looking at the private road that exists by Dollar General and taking that. But he, he did not have an objection when I spoke to him about it. Either. Other than he did add that about uh, the road by Dollar General. I did I did speak with Mr. Wilburn. I called because I wanted to hear his his side of this, and and he said that you know it, it he's supportive of, of he, he thinks the project's been a good project. He understands the road, um, and like I said, his bigger concern was the opposite end of where you tie in because it's I mean. That road right now, I mean, there's there's nothing you can't do anything with it. Whereas this one, the next person that comes in, all they got to do is, is tie in. There's no question of well, what I'm tying into is not a car, it's not a private road, um, and that's exactly what he shared with me. Was I'm he said I have a bigger concern about the other end as far as this one. He says this one, whoever comes in, they're going to tie in, they're going to finish the road, they're going to move on out. And, and the research I have done is is consistent with what they're saying, usually all the property owners share in a collector road, and to me, if you put in 55%, you've done your share. I mean, that's, you know, I, if somebody came in, if you finish this, somebody comes in and builds, was to build this exact same project to the north, then they don't have to do anything except put it in, so, I mean, it, <clears throat> they get, they get a benefit, so. Um. I guess, I guess the only other thing I would ask, and not being a developer, I don't know this answer, but. If, if you really had no intention of putting that road in, why did you put it in your plan to begin with? We were required by the city. So therefore, you knew going in that we were going to ask you to finish it. Well, we knew that uh, we knew that it was a city required a request. We, as the mayor just said, we were in a time crunch. We had to go forward, and so in an ideal world, if we had not had to do the three phase, which was not something that we had planned on, if we had not had delays, because you know, you, you, you mentioned the inspector, th those delays are really meaningful numbers to us because that's construction interest that we pay, that is, and, and most importantly, not, not, I mean, it's all the general requirements, construction costs that we have because that clock keeps ticking. Um, so if we hadn't had to absorb those costs, we hadn't had the delay, and it's, it's the cost associated with the delay. Uh, if we hadn't had that, we probably would have had the $28,000 to build this road. But I guess it was the, kind of the perfect storm because sure. it's never just one thing, as Greg says, but it was the culmination of all of those things that put us in this place where we don't have the dollars at the end of the project to do it. But as developers, I'm sure you guys can appreciate us as a community I mean, you put a, a, a site plan in place, it had a road going there, and let's say the board chooses to not go forward with that and require you to finish that out. As the next developer coming in here, they're going to expect to not have to finish their projects either, and then the next guy down the road to not finish their projects either. So that puts us in a position to have to always be going back here, and that's 
Well, it's just not a good place to be. And I would, I would respectfully say that, that, that I, I don't think that would be so, because I think that what you're approving is you're approving us uh, building out one half of the road with no contribution from anyone else. And so if somebody comes in, when that next landowner uh, who buys or whoever owns that property comes forward with their development, they're going to finish the road out, which is what you all want when you want to see that pro that full property develop, not just the south side, but the north side as well. But isn't that just on your property? <coughs> it will be your property. Because right, because we're going to dedicate it. But as of right now, that is on your property. Yes. Yes. Right. Until it's dedicated, yeah. Yes. It, to, to, be, to be fair, if that wouldn't have been required, her purchase would not have been a perfect rectangle. It would have been more, looked more like Utah where it would have had a bite out where that land, and that land but would have saved all the that's not how real estate is sold. <laughs> no, it, well, it would have, instead of doing a perfect right. line there, it would have jogged in and done this, and then she would have been dedicating this outside strip here. Now, to go back, we you look at $30,000 of electrical, if you talk about commitments and consistency, which is the two things that developers would really like to hear, and we won't always like what we hear from City Hall, but when you get a commitment and then you have consistency about the follow through, well, well two things one at the very beginning, you know, not the very beginning, but part way through, and one at the very end, you, know, you got signs on one end, makes sense, I understand life, safety, health issues, it would have been nice if we would have known earlier, then you talk about the three phase electric, which I still don't have a great handle on. The debt's going to be two plus thousand dollars there, no. Plus some of the delay in that we were not told at the end your electric department gave us a little bit of heat for putting in some of the infrastructure, meaning the electrical grid towards later in the development, whereas usually you like to drop that in first while you're doing your grading. The problem is, is because that thing was going back and forth and then we had the unfortunate demise, and then who's going to pick up the, the, the standard on either side to take and push that through? So there was that natural delay you know, management by indecision while that was being refought. When it finally came out, that was months and months and months past for us to then come back and get that electric put in. Like that. So you, you have some delays that went on there that it would have been a little less expensive. I did not try and quantify that if we had done that infrastructure at the same time we were doing the initial grading and we were dropping all the sewer lines, dropping all the sanitary lines. Like that. So again, you have no one perfect thing that we could do. I could write out probably a hundred items in a perfect world changed that we wished wouldn't have. But made a commitment, we'll do this. On the flip side, you folks have made a commitment that you will you expect us to build this and then that end was up. So otherwise it probably wouldn't likely bid here when you just suck that move on. Do you not run into that pretty much everywhere you go? <clears throat> um very rarely do we get one of those where somebody kind of goes goes crazy. And you know earlier it was mentioned, you know, get lenders to do this, get that to do that. The way it's set up, it is not a legal issue. It is an administrative functional issue. That we were asked to do some things that were outside the original scope of work, which is a approved set of plans. As long as we build them to those plans, the lender, tax credit investor, state of Missouri, and Ms. Pally, as long as we're adhering to those plans, which should be decoded, a couple times you find something that maybe isn't just right. As I said, the, the, the NHB, inspector came out and he didn't like the reading he was getting on on the efficiency at a certain point had us put in just a little bit more insulation okay you expect minor changes that's what contingencies mm -hmm. are major changes where you change the game plan or you change the rule book that's very very abnormal very abnormal most municipalities recognize that if they kind of make a commitment it's been done in a public forum which is why the sealed and stamps and you have to have a set on site, what did we approve? And if I walk over, you better be building it the way I approved it. That also allows for turnover. And, and I, I completely understand that, but I guess that's kind of how I feel about the street too. Mm -hmm. It was in the original plan, and I kind of expected. Well, trade the street for the electric. Yeah, well, <laughs> things happen. I'm just trying to be like. Right. Okay. But again, it is a beautiful project. It, it truly is. Well, and at the end of the day, uh, I, you know, and I think I told you this two years ago when I came. You know, we. Uh, for every three applications that MHDC receives, there's one. Uh, and so this is a very competitive process. It's a really big thing that your community got it. And it, they are really wonderful, not only for the end product, but also for the economic development that they create for your community while the, process, the project's under construction. So I hope you all are very, very pleased. And you know, and I, as I told you two years ago, we will manage it appropriately. And so it will look just as good as it does today, five years from now. I have one more question. Sure. Uh, are, are we violating any uh, ordinances or rules if we approve this? 
No, that's what the variance process is for. That's what we're putting. So we're through. not violating. No, the we're changing. <coughs> Yes, what we're doing. asking to do is to change our ordinance. Yeah. We're not, no, no, it's no, very, no, it's very, 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 so, uh, yes, if I would come to the city, and, and I will tell you, we've talked with the Wellborns about uh, their property, and, um, and if that was the, the requirement, yes, I would absolutely put it in. Uh, it, for, Greg said something that was so important. It's all about, you know, consistency and, you know, and just whatever the rules are. If I know that rule going in, I can follow it. And it's when there are changes that, and the culmination of those changes, end up costing us money, that's when it becomes a problem. Hopefully we won't have those changes. Sure. Okay, that's now, the there's, there's, been, there's been some evolution, shall we say, here at City Hall. All of the moment. Yes, I have some questions. Um, we've all faced a lot of inquiries from constituents asking about the project, and, and I agree it is a very nice looking project. Can you please um, address the question that has come to me about the streets not being complete? Um, something about the base coat is on the street, but the hot asphalt is That's on what the I was trying to say earlier. It is tenants only scheduled for next this Saturday. And there's concrete curbs and gutters. All right, so where the water would run, because it's crowned. So where the water would run on the outside is concrete. In the center will be crowned asphalt. Right now, we're a couple inch layer below. The reason for that is because is there's still so much combination of construction equipment, there's little bobcats up there, the little rolling machine that's been rolling up on, uh, you know, to compact up on the cul-de-sac to get the, the rock base <laughs> down for the next pour. And so you have all that going on. And we had went to the, to the city and we'd ask if when we poured that, if we could pour it a couple inches low and come back with what they call a second lift. So I'm using terminology, but if you were to ask somebody in the business and they use that phrase back to you, then it would make more sense. Instead of pouring this much in one shot, we pour this much, we're coming back with what you and I might call a top coat, it, which would be more than aesthetically pleasing. It won't have rocks that some trucks kind of ground right down in, or it won't have quite that, that dirt mark that I don't care what you try to do because it's clay that all these trucks riding back and forth, it's going to start off with dirty streets and a bit, a bit chipped up because that's a hardened, that's a hardened asphalt, and, but it will kind of like chip or it will get grooves in it during its initial time. So we'd ask Happy, and we have some exchanges with both email. He met us out on site, and we specifically asked, can we come back and give it a top coat? We've done this everywhere that we have poured asphalt like that. We think that the entire project benefits it. You end up with a nice, clean look at the end of the project. So yes, the streets are incomplete. I'll go on record. The streets are not complete. The goal is, is to complete them the way the weather looks, OK? <laughs> Saturday. OK. So we owe you two inches on your street. We owe two inches on her street. And then we owe the balance of that little cold sack that just has those four buildings on it. But that's a great question. Well, and those are the typical kind of questions that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So people are saying, why isn't the project complete? Um, I had a constituent that was concerned that early on when some of the first occupants moved in that there were not working smoke detectors. Can you address that? My understanding is because every one of those are tested and they're all sort of unison. And usually people, you know, if they don't have one, we'll pull one. You take a pole, because not everybody's vertically challenged like I, but those are also tall as I've seen. You take a pole and you hit that little button. First one goes off, and then they go off in a series. Well, All saying, those work. I'm just saying that there was a concern when some of the initial residents moved in. Here's, that. No, when, when what they did was is we fired up each building before we had the grid in place with temporary electric. And we did a walkthrough, which included your inspector, third-party inspector, our people. And we tested every outlet, et cetera, just to make sure there weren't any issues and to find out anything that Chris might have that was a pet peeve, that, that uh, the third party might have that's a pet peeve. Then we came back and there was a reinspection. But at that stage, everybody kind of had their, their pet peeves they were looking for of each inspection group. And all, each of those things are tested again before the ones come in. They also do test life safety health issues, they test the water, hot and cold running, shut off valves, the whole bit. They also briefly run like the uh, dishwashing units. 
uh, and to do the shower heads and check all the valves and everything. That is part of an inspection process. So you're saying then there was not ever a time when there were not To my knowledge, no. Smoke detectors. To my knowledge, no. Okay. Okay. But, but if you know different, I, I would like to go by that unit, you know, either tomorrow morning or, or, or ask somebody to on Thursday morning and test it. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions. And I, I don't like to call employees and former employees out by name, so I'm going to say city inspector. Um, it's probably important to know that the allegations that were made by the site superintendent about the city inspector were denied by the city inspector and were never proven to be val uh, valid. So the city um, <coughs> agreed to hire a third party independent inspector at your request um, and did indeed agree to pay two thirds of the portion of the bill for that third party inspector, IBTS. Um, I said up here, you stood right there before us, and we talked about paying for that. The city agreed to pay $10,000 for you to hire a third party inspector to be able to get your permitting things Actually, done. Actually, you, you folks hired them. Okay. Well, we hired. Proper agents. Yes, we hired them at the urgency um, of Alderman Bachelman, and I believe you were the one that suggested IBTS be the third party inspector that we hire. Um, it's unfortunate that we agreed to do that based on allegations that were made against an employee. But I feel real strongly that we've already paid not only $10,000, but now I hear $12,000 to help you expedite your project to help overcome some of the delays in the project that you maintain with part of our employee. So I'm troubled continuing to support um, and underwrite the expense of your project. I believe all contractors have cost overruns, and that's regrettable, that, but that shouldn't be the fault of your customer. So, um, I'd like to comment to that. First of all, certainly. I don't believe that either of us have ever alluded to his supposed statements. I wasn't there. You know, officer, I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't hear him say it, therefore I can't, you know, swear to Bible and do it. The actions were more important in some of the comments and some of the things that were said where I was on the phone either directly with him or on a conference call with Nate Leon and our head of project management. And some of the issues we went through that dealt with geotech and dealt with soil and dealt with when you hit rock and his expectations, some of it is in writing in terms of emails where you kind of went back and forth and you go to that consistency work. And the inconsistency <coughs> of the, the expectations when we were trying to pour slabs cost us a minimum I'm saying four, and I really think it's more like six to seven weeks. Our complaints were about the, the approach, the methodology, not about any statements, but about the methodology. And then secondarily, there was a, uh, you know, I mean, if we unfortunately have to go down that path, there was like what I call a silo effect, where by on a, in a, in a smaller team, when somebody gets off the team, there needs to be somebody who can step into the place. There appeared to be either a fear or an edict that said nobody else will do the inspection while I'm gone. And some of the comments that came back, including comments to me about, well, I'm going on a vacation, or I'm going on this seminar, and I'll just guess y'all see you next Tuesday. Well, those type of comments don't step into the professional as much and the functionality as much. Um, there's times where an inspector is not available and somebody else from, from the city staff that has at least marginal experience but some understanding and at the level that we were inspecting at that time i think because there's a geotech that kind of provides a good third party for all participants that we could all rely upon that but every time he left town it was like a silo nobody wanted to do anything and so we just went to a standstill and there wasn't that courtesy that you generally get and i've had it from others of your employees that said i'm going to tell you now bud if you think you're going to need me friday i'm out i'm out for a three-day weekend here so anything you need you got to get between now and thursday those type of comments show a little bit more professionalism and courtesy within the field. You know, the field hands that are usually making the phone calls. We were not receiving that professional courtesy. We were receiving a, a, a lot of attitude that was starting to, to breach your norm. And, and it really was costing money. So again, it was methodology uh, more than it was commentary. Because the commentary, just if I don't hear it, I don't believe it. And I don't want to split hairs with you, but I know that you stood here and I personally asked you if you had reached out to our interim city administrator and you had not. You had reached out to the mayor 
and the city interim city administrator had had replied to this board that there were people in place to fill in when our building inspector was unavailable. So you I, may, I, I you may not have that. known that, you may not have been aware of that, but had you reached out. I don't out, want to relitigate right. something that no. occurred. There's no, no, need, to re know. There's no yeah. need to relitigate. It was it was admitted to me we were not meeting our own standards because there was there was a there was an interview held with the interim city administrator <coughs> with the staff about the allegations and yes there was denial there was there was no further follow up as was asked for. Um, however, it was admitted the standards we have on I believe it's two hours or whatever it is for for inspections we were not meeting our deadline the assigned deadlines I mean it would be it was same day it was two three days before we were getting out there so it was admitted that we were not meeting our own standard which is why we we pushed to get that obviously we had staff that was either too busy or unavailable for whatever reason there was no disciplinary action taken for a staff member we just simply said we're obviously short staffed in this area when it comes to this project and that was the push for getting the outside your project wasn't the only one that wasn't getting inspections yeah, we received, I heard that, we received yeah, numerous yeah, complaints, so it was telephone yeah. yeah. So we're not again, we're not going to rehash all that yeah, because yeah. it's not necessary. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. so I just wanted, I just want it to be clear but that the city by somebody has else in the audience and not by one of the two of us. We would right. like to stick to the fact, kind of like you'll right. and I'm just holding up to run the tail end of that. Yeah, I just want to be clear that the city has already uh, paid twelve thousand dollars to we're not asking the city to pay for it. Right. As in, to recognize that some costs over here and I'm sure balance when I came up here and kind of And have a couple of questions for Ms. Hart. Um, your tax credits that you receive from the federal government and the state government amount to a little over $9 million over a 10-year period of time, is that correct? No, they're $650,000. Can we speak up, please? Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to calculate, sorry. sorry. Um, I, I can get that exact number to you, but I would think it's really a six and a half million dollar federal number, um, so $650,000 of federal credits, and I'll have to get back to you and tell you what the exact state number is. And those are sold to investors that, uh, those are not sold at par, those are sold at a discount, right. and so, but I can give you all that information. And I believe those were bought by Raymond James and Bank of America. Raymond James is our federal investor. Mm -hmm. uh, Bank of America was not a direct investor. They may have participated in a fund that Raymond James has, and then the state credits were purchased by uh, CRA. Mm -hmm. And how much of your own money is in the project? Whoa. <laughs> uh, we don't have a, our, our investment is on the front end uh, with respect to the project, and then we have a fair amount of time <laughs> invested in this project. So. Um, that's what our, our investment is. <clears throat> so you essentially have no monetary investment in the project? Well, no, that's not true because we, uh, we, we earn a developer fee through these projects and we don't get that developer fee paid initially. So um, uh, there's definitely a, a monetary component because, as you know, I've been working on it for two years. Um, so we've been here all that time. The other thing, and probably the most important thing, is I have a financial guarantee. I guarantee that debt. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely have yeah. uh, money at risk. Mm -hmm. And that, that guarantee, and this goes back to me teasing about doing a number of deals and speaking my way, you want me to sign what? And this is good for how long? Is these deals the ownership? So from a corporate citizen point of view, you're a corporate citizen of that community for a minimum of 15 years because it's a 15 year compliance period. To be truthful, those things are usually sell more like you're 17 and 18. And especially if by chance, you know, Dell were to go across the street and do another phase, you usually try and sell them about the same time so you get kind of a package deal. So that, that could put her out here until year 20. But let's just say 15 to 17 years that you're committed. That, that guarantee it starts out where if you have a development deficit guarantee, where for some reason we didn't, they didn't have really good geo and ran into just a ton of rock in there. That earned developer fee plus money out of her pocket might have to be put in there. You have an operating deficit guarantee where for a big chunk of the years of that development, if the thing runs in the red, you're writing a check each year. You That's have a tax credit guarantee where is there's an income limit for folks that can take and move in there. But if your staff or if you hire a third party, if their staff, pardon the phrase, screws the pooch and puts people in there that shouldn't be, you have what they call recapture. 
The one thing that we as developers don't make it very clear is, is when you go in and you say, I'd like to put in affordable housing, everybody's first thought is HUD. Well, HUD backwards is dub. This is an IRS program, okay? <laughs> All bad jokes notwithstanding, this is an IRS program. Those people do not take a prisoners, okay? So if, if as an owner, if Deb screws up on any mine that I still own, if we screw up in the management, they write a nice little, they call it ADA 23, which is kind of like being sent to the principal and send it into the IRS. The IRS comes in and they just turn you upside down. By the time you get through with it, you, you just don't care. You just be up. I've never had one of those turned in on me, but that means that you're applying a lot of time and effort. You're actually beefing your staff up. So that fee that you're earning, it actually can be carried forward for 17 years, and it prepays you for two and a half backwards. So when you kind of come out in terms of what your money is, it's an opportunity cost. You know, of hundreds of thousands of dollars, plus you're fronting these things, you're into it for anywhere from fifteen to forty-five thousand dollars on a maybe when you turn in the application. If it's not funded, you might be able to use parts of that, but you might have to pay a smaller fee the next year to re-up some of those tests to turn in the next application. So that forty thousand dollar application might only be twenty-six the following year if you don't get funded. But if you never get funded, you're now out either the forty or the twenty-six or both. Okay, so from a cost benefit analysis, it's not a perfect you have $175,000 into it, or you have this, or you have that. You have a lot of staff time, your time, investments, lodging, food. And also, to take a step with the latest, we send ourselves to water classes. And those things cost seminars and things like that. So it's not a perfect right check. Alderman Bowman, did you have any further questions? No, I think so. Alderman Bachman, you had your hand up a second ago. Are you? Okay. All right. Any other questions? We have them. All right. Thank you both. Um, with that, um, I believe we are ready for the second reading of Council Bill 65. A second reading, Council Bill 65, an ordinance authorizing a variance for the developer of the Harrisonville Villas, a variance of the approved subdivision plat by not requiring timber drive to extend to the west property line. All right. I'll need a roll call on this, please. Alderman Dickerson? Aye. Alderman Bowman? Nay. Alderman Turner? Aye. Alderman Bachelman? Aye. Alderman Milner? Nay. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Reese? Nay. All right, and Council Bill 65 becomes Ordinance 03417. Um, Mr. Mayor, point of order, please. I believe it requires five votes to pass an ordinance. Not when you're yeah. short one board member, it doesn't. Well, Thank you. You're out of order. I beg your pardon, Mr. Mayor. Um, you might want to hear about my conversation with MML today. If you have something to bring up, Mr. Fairfield, you are a legal counsel when you're passing an ordinance when you are a seven member because you have a vacancy on your board. Well, I, I would probably have, because I haven't the question before, but the the requirement, as I recall, was a majority of the board um, that's that's elected and in, in, in place. So it would be different if several members that are elected that are still on the board are missing. You would still need the majority, but since you essentially have a seven mayor board at this point in time, four would be a majority. Well, Mr. Fairbairn, first of all, two things: would you please provide me your legal opinion in writing? And second of all, um, state statute 79.130 says that it takes the majority of the Board of Aldermen to pass an ordinance and that the vacancy counts. And I was confirming that with MML today. Which section so, are, you, do you, are you? It's chapter 79.130. Did you have a particular section? Um, it talks about what is required to pass an ordinance and it's the majority of the elected or seated board and if that's the case, then the vacant seat counts. They're not seated because there's nobody in the well, office. So I think you're trying to make legal interpretation, which is not your department. This is Mr. Fairfield's department, well, Mr. which Mayor. until he provides a legal interpretation, this is what we will go by. Okay, so will you please provide me your written legal opinion then? Because I will provide an opinion to the board. That's right. contrary yeah, to yeah. what um, Missouri Municipal League Attorney has said. Thank you. All right, moving forward, 
Um, moving forward, um, Council Bill 67 um, is also ready for a second reading. Um, before we have the second reading, I wanted to, to clear the air on something else. Um, it was referenced at the last meeting that only a certain section of this uh, Chapter 430 was uh, discussed and approved at the Community Development Meeting. Um, I'm going to reference the July 18th minutes for Community Development. Discussion item, uh, action items was Chapter 430 revisions. Minutes state Happy Welch went over the proposed changes with the committee. Uh, he will do some further research on the revisions. Those present were Happy Welch, uh, Jim Clark, and Jamie Martin, in addition to David Dickerson, Matt Turner, Brian Hassick, Clint Long, and Brad Boffin. <coughs> August 15, 2017, those present, David Dickerson, Matt Turner, Brian Hassig, Clint Long, Brad Bockelman. Also present were Happy Welch, Jim Clark, uh, Judy Bowman, and Jamie Martin. Um, we have approval of minutes. Action item, Chapter 430 revisions. The Chapter 430 revisions have been accepted as written with the revisited deletion of Section 430.040B9, approved as amended and forwarded to the board. As that reads, the entire revisions were approved as amended and moved to the board. It was not simply one section as was referenced in the last meeting. So that clears the air on what the committee was intending to move forward. So with that being said, we are ready for second reading of Council Bill 67. I believe during first reading everybody expressed their opinions, how they felt. I believe we are ready for reading and ready for a vote. Um, so can we please have second reading of Council Bill 67. Council Bill 67, second reading, ordinance of the Board of Aldermen of Harrisonville, Missouri, repealing Chapter 430 of the City Code and enacting in lieu thereof an amended Chapter 430 urban redevelopment regulations of the City of Harrisonville, Missouri, and establishing an effective date. All right. Could I have a roll call, please? Is there time for discussion? We've had a discussion on this. It's the second reading, which usually comes to a vote. Very well. Okay. Unless you have something to add that we didn't have in the last meeting, I think, like I said, we we hashed over everyone's opinions in the last one. Well, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, I agree, and I did not take exception with the fact that the revision identifying the members of the corporation was discussed in the community development committee meeting. I don't take exception with that. I don't accept, take exception with the fact that it was discussed in the community development committee meeting to require a deposit from the developer for legal and financial feasibility studies. I don't take exception with that. Uh, but I don't think you'll find in your minutes anywhere where the addition to item C under review process was discussed. It was discussed at the meeting you were not present at, and there was not a detailed account of the. It was the, it was accounted that we discussed the revisions and the members that were present. If you want to ask any of them that were there, I believe we discussed all the revisions, and that's where it was actually initially suggested to move to the board at that time. But there was a request to make an update to the requirement of how far down the. The ownership level we went. No, I'm not talking about either one of those. I'm not talking about the language that <coughs> that Mr. Clark wanted to review to make sure we were in compliance with the state statute. I'm not talking about that section, and I'm not talking about the section of identifying the corporate members. I'm talking about this section under the review process, item two, which has been added. You can see if you look on the page. Under item C, there is a number one and there are two number twos. Because the first number two of the initial development plan review is the section where you're adding where you wish to appoint a committee of the members of this board to review. It's saying I have the option to appoint a committee. It doesn't say I have to, it doesn't say I will, it says at my discretion. And what I'm saying is this section was not agreed upon by the Community Development Committee. Yes, it was, because they approved as amended, which is it approved the as the whole the whole packet 
in addition to the amendment. That is what the minutes Maybe. state. It doesn't make any difference. We've worked, we've no, it does make a difference because that's what was approved. The full board okay. and then you guys get to decide. We just make the recommendation. Exactly. And it that doesn't was the recommendation. mean that that's the way it's going to be. You get to decide. All right. All right. And it was brought to you to decide. All right. I don't know what you're complaining about. Okay. We are ready for the roll call. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Reese. Aye. Okay. All right. I'll point of order on this ordinance as well. Okay. Council Bill 67 becomes ordinance 03418. <laughs> Following her. All right. Please. Council Bill. Hey. Council Bill 68. Council Bill 68, a resolution of the Board of Aldermen of Harrisonville, Missouri authorizing the city administrator to enter into a five-year service contract with Traxair Distribution, Inc. for the bulk supply of liquid oxygen at the Harrisonville Water Treatment Plant. All right. One of the processes at the new plant is uh, ozone and requires liquid oxygen. Uh, we went through the process of locating a company that could provide that. Uh, they will provide the equipment and the oxygen uh, but part of that agreement is to sign up for a five-year uh, agreement with them uh, on a contract. Um, Ted Martin went through the process looking at uh, different companies. Maxar came up with the best, uh, the best deal, and we recommend approval. Is it a uh, lock-in? Do they have the option to raise their rates on us? There is, is no, in? yeah, there is no. There is a chance that they can, they can raise them. It's listed in there how that would be done. And if we want to, then... Um, uh, for that or come back with a, a, a different response or if we go to another company and they give us for less then we can re require that they get that. And this is for the only thing that we're going to look after, is that correct? Yep. Yeah, out at the water plant. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to approve. All right. I have a motion from Alderman Dickerson. Second from Alderman Long. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And Council Bill 68 becomes Resolution R039. And that concludes our agenda items tonight. Uh, Alderman Committee Reports. Alderman Bowman. Um, just a question of the City Administrator. Can you give us an update on the status of the contract for the trash hauling? Uh, we're working on it as quickly as possible. We've been in the middle of the SRO contract and a number of other contracts, and that's slowed us down. I've talked to Brian Moore. Uh, he's anxiously awaiting it, and uh, Mr. Perpill is working on it this week. When is that changeover? January 1st, but they need to order their yeah. trash cans and get, get prepared for it. So uh, we talked about it. We're working as fast as we can to get him uh, where he feels comfortable with the agreement with the city. Thank you. All right. Alderman Bachman. Nothing. All right. Alderman Reese. Nothing. Alderman Miller. All right. Alderman Dickerson. Not me. Alderman Long. Just yay again. Just yay again. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Turner. Nope. All right. Mr. Welch. Uh, just real fast, I left uh, some information at your seats about the MPUA and how that's divided up with the different organizations. You had asked some questions about that. Might be something just for you to review. If you have any, uh, any issues with it, let me know. All right. I um, wanted to point out that uh, coming up Saturday, October 28th, will be the Haunted Hay Rides out at the park. Um, last year, last few years they've run them on Friday and Saturday nights. They've decided we're going to only do it one night this year and run it later than usual, but uh, try to squeeze everybody in on Saturday because there's more volunteers available on Saturday. Um, Hoping to uh, uh, maybe make a few changes this year so there's some more surprises, but that's always a good time. Um, I want to point out and, and make a request here of the alderman. If you have a concern or something that you're concerned about before a meeting hits, when it could, could raise a question, you need to bring that up before a meeting. You need to make somebody aware. My phone works. My email works just fine. I can assure you staff has no issue getting a hold of me at any time. And if you're willing to hold off on something, 
that's not a problem. We've done it before. We've held stuff off the agenda. We've moved things to a later meeting. So trying to do this for shock and awe, if that is what your goal is, is not working. It's not shock and awe. It is disruptive to the meeting and could be handled in a much more civil manner. So going forward, if you have something that is of, you believe, significant concern, you need to raise that prior to a meeting, not in the meeting, unless, of course, it hits you, I guess, right in the meeting. Um, and that's all I have to add to that. <clears throat> um, I do want to comment about last meeting there was a concern about the committees. And there was a there was a an assertion of of not sharing information. Well, if you recall, we had committees when everyone on this board in 2015, the ones elected then, there was some contention about how those were set up. There was some discussion. There were several revisions made, and at one point everybody sat on a committee. It was done, I believe, in violation of Sunshine Law, the decision was made prior to a meeting that we were going to vote out committees. Well, I don't know who spoke to the attorney at that time. He shared with me that the board has the right to decide how they conduct their business. I won't argue with that. What he failed to mention is that the mayor also has the right to decide how he conducts his business when it comes to preparing things to bring to the meeting. And so I have a right to form committees. We determined that. It was decided. So when somebody is not on a committee, it's because they voted themselves off the committees that they were on. If you voted against having a committee, you pretty much told me I don't wish to serve on a committee because I voted to get rid of them. And I'm tired of hearing about it. I don't want to hear about it any further. If anything, I would be working to show that you could add value to those committees and perhaps you would get a place on one of those committees to assist with bringing recommendations to this board. And that's all I will ever say again about committees. And that is where I will end tonight. I make a motion to adjourn. I second that. I have a motion from Alderman Dickerson to adjourn and a second from Alderman Wall. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed?